Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. First of all, I just wanted to ask for permission about something. I spent the day today in Cincinnati at a conference. Got on pretty late tonight on Monday night, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to record one video for North America, one for South America, and I'll kind of call it quits after that. First thing I'd like to start off with, though, is these four maps, which are from the National Climatic Data Center. What you're looking at here are temperature ranks for average temperature, max, min, and precipitation. Now, I'm going to start in precipitation because right now, uh, for the month of October, only one state actually shows below average, okay? And that's New Mexico. Now, we've seen this fall that this region right in through here has been very dry. And there's been a stretch from eastern Texas over to the Carolinas that's showed up dry as of late. But we're looking here just at the month of October, and that's what the statistics hold. We were drier in Wisconsin and drier than average in uh, in Montana when you look at the last 45 to 60 days, but I just wanted to point out these stats for you. Now, let's come right over uh, here. This would be minimum temperatures. Take a look at this. In terms of overnight lows, we had several states kind of surrounding the Great Lakes here into the Northeast that had their warmest Octobers on record when you think about the minimum temperatures. When you stitch it all together, Ohio, where I was today, I uh, had its warmest October on record. But I drove through a lot of uh, ice pellets and some snow coming out of Ohio today. So we've certainly seen a pattern shift and that's what I wanna talk about. Because this is the month to date temperature ranks by climate district. So instead of looking at this by state, let's do it by climate district. And you notice that the Southwest is where we've got the warmest air right now. And what I want to just discuss with you is many of the things we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks about the way we thought this pattern was going to shape up at the end of November are actually kind of coming into fruition here. We expect some weak ridging over the southwest and over the west coast to develop. And the pattern at times may do something a bit more like this. We're possibly setting up a block in the North Atlantic. I'll tell you more about that in a few seconds. But expect to get shots of colder air coming out of the Canadian prairie, through the northern plains, through the Great Lakes, into the northeast, and extending all the way through the mid-south into the southeast as well as we finish out this month. Now on the precipitation side, let's take a look at what we've got here. This is a month to date, so November 1st to November the 15th. The jet stream at times has retreated toward Canada. And while we have seen some pretty heavy snowfall that has come through parts of the Northern Plains in the upper Midwest, and a strong onshore flow causing major flooding problems here uh, in this part of Washington. You can see it's south of that, we've found more drier conditions than we have wetter for a lot of places. Now, before I dig into this, I just want to show you the snow we recently had. One of my favorite websites, uh, if, you, if you go here, let me zoom back out. Uh, this is uh, just nohrcs.noaa.gov forward slash snowfall. You can get access to this. And what I want to show you here is the three days ending on the 13th first. So this was the first round of snow we saw coming in here. And then let's add to it what we just had. So let's go here. And this is the second round. So we've had some lake effect. This has brought some snow showers into the eastern Corn Belt, out of the western Corn Belt, out of the upper Midwest. And so this is uh, really just indicative of this shift in the pattern bringing in some, some colder air. Now, what's going on today? Let me just take you to some of the latest satellite imagery before the sunset today. You can see here, if you kind of look through the clouds, we can still see some of that snow in Wisconsin and also in parts of Michigan and right into this place, right in through here in South Dakota. But as you see this, what I really want you to focus in on is what's actually coming to us out of the West. There's some very, very strong winds. Look at the gravity waves coming off the mountains here. And this is pushing right up into Alberta tonight and into Saskatchewan tomorrow morning. And we're gonna see this upper level piece of the jet stream really kind of curl up just perfect to make a deep low pressure system that's gonna go across the Canadian prairie. It appears that the active storm track through the next seven plus days is gonna favor the Canadian prairie. And one last thing before I leave this animation, you can notice the fog almost, uh, it's almost the entire length of the Central Valley in California. See it there underneath that cloud cover? Really just kinda need to see that. So what are we looking at? All hazards weather map late tonight. Let's get a refresh on this. Uh, late tonight here on Monday night. And most of the coloring you see here is related to wind. It's either high wind warning, wind advisory, red flag warning, that's what you see here in these areas. And there's a deep low that's cutting right out of Alberta into Saskatchewan in the next 12 to 24 hours. 
Now, before we dig into that low, I do want to show you we do have uh, frost, freeze, uh, advisories, warnings, and uh, we're still seeing the colder air exit over here and really push toward the coast. And when I look back at the month of, of November through the 14th, that is an area that still has yet to see a freezing temperature. So we're going to be pushing that colder air in place here because everywhere that you see gray on this map is where we've already had a temperature below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Now let's come back to that system. This is what we're going to be seeing by tomorrow morning. A very deep low pressure center developing here. And you can see these winds out of the west. We're expecting these winds at times to be gusting from 50 to 70 miles an hour. With high pressure over the southeast, though, look at this flow here. That warm-up we saw today in the plains is going to extend to the east, and it's going to take a couple of days to move across the east before much colder air comes in behind this. But before I go anywhere else, I just want to step you up. Let's go up to the jet stream level winds and just see the pattern that's creating this. There's the broad trough. You can see this very sharp ridge that comes right in through here. There's a jet streak rounding the base of this trough, and you kind of cut this all up. We find very strong upper level divergence right here. And that is basically where, let's just go look at it again, where that surface low pressure system is going to be sitting. And it's going to be developing rapidly, and we're expecting extremely strong winds. Now, how strong are those winds going to be? I'm going to use the 12Z European to get a gauge on this. So we're actually looking at cumulative. Um, maximum uh, wind gusts, okay? So we're just looking for the strongest winds, and let's take this all the way out one full week. Now, what we expect tomorrow throughout the day is to have winds in this area that are going to be easily gusting 40 to 50 miles an hour. And if you get into these colors, we're talking up here 50, 60, possibly approaching 70 miles an hour. And those stronger winds are going to move through the Midwest and head over toward the east. And then we're going to possibly see something, probably some quite powerful coastal lows developing. And I'll explain more about that in just a few moments. From there, though, let's just take a look at the bigger picture through the next seven days. With that Canadian storm track, Okay, much of the United States is going to be on the drier side of things through the next seven days. Now, that doesn't mean no precipitation, but on the drier side of things, because as those lows go quickly here. The fronts just get blasted through the United States rather quickly, so they don't deliver a lot of precipitation. Let me show you what I mean here. With the coldest air staying north, there we go, we do expect this to be the heaviest corridor of snowfall. But after we watch the snow that's behind the system still exiting here, we do have some snow showers here. We're going to be in the lookout. Watch this. Once we get into next weekend for some possi possibly some more snow around the Great Lakes and into the interior of New England. Now, to see this unfold, let's go over to the 18Z NAM. So let's get this through into early Tuesday morning. There it is. That's 5 a.m. Tuesday morning Central Time. With that low tracking way up here, look at how tightly spaced these isobars are. Now, what's going to happen is there's high pressure here. So the flow comes around it and gets pulled into the low, which is there. The main cold frontal boundary is really tucked right into this area. So this can be much colder air coming in this direction, but a major warm up out here in the warm sector of this cyclone. And it's going to continue to press across. We could get some snow showers in North Dakota coming into northern Minnesota again. But with that front, you can see here that it's going to be kind of pencil thin, but we could get a band of showers, maybe even a rumble of thunder along this as we watch this front come through parts of the eastern Corn Belt, stretching all the way down to the Red River Valley of the south. And that's going to pull farther to the east as we get into the day on Thursday. Now from here, I think it's best just to flip over to our multi-model analysis, so the GFS on the left and European on the right. We're going to watch that same system curl up in Canada. Both models really keyed in on this pattern through the early part of this week. And as we take this out toward Wednesday, this is now Wednesday at 6 p.m., Position of the fronts right in through here. Both models really well timed on this. That's that brief round of showers, possibly a thunderstorm in there. And that's quickly going to move off to the east. See it? So at this point, here we are Thursday evening. Let's work our way through the day on Friday, get into Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, and Saturday evening. There's a chance that another system could curl up in the prairie. See, it's here in the European. It's a little more progressive in the GFS, which we're quite used to. This could bring in some more showers here into parts of the Great Lakes. We are going to be watching the tail end of that front still slicing through parts of Florida, which is why we see some wetter weather there as well. Remember, as this system comes in, it's first going to go through the Pacific Northwest. So Friday in the Pacific Northwest is going to see a pretty active day there. See that? That's through the day on Friday. 
Now, what I want you to see at the end of this animation is we're getting out there pretty far in this forecast. So this is out there toward next, um, you know, Sunday night into Monday morning. Both models are attempting to develop a trough here, or reinforce a trough here. We could see that low come through with more snow in the upper Midwest. This would be Monday morning coming out of Sunday night, and that low could really start to deepen here. Now, I'm all the way out here next Tuesday morning, and what I want you to notice is both models, this is pretty good agreement here, are attempting to build what seems to be a pretty sizable East Coast storm system. See that? And why this is happening is because we're getting some pretty sizable downstream blocking in the flow of the jet stream, and I want to talk to you about that. Now, this is all about there on the 23rd. What we're noticing here is that the North Atlantic Oscillation is going from being weakly positive over the next few days to really dropping off down here into the negative territory, maybe up to two to three standard deviations below average. Now, what does all that mean? It means this. You're looking down on the North Pole. This is all the way out there the next Monday. Now, what we're going to watch here is the potential for a block to set up right before Thanksgiving over Greenland. Now, what I'm talking about is this ridge of high pressure here, and we've got almost an omega look to it. See that? And what that does is that keeps a lot of cold air in the eastern half of the United States, a lot of cold air over Europe, and it has the kind of the reflection of that pattern is a trough that retreats west here in the Gulf of Alaska and the flow comes around it like that. So this typically means warmer west, colder east. It typically means very active storm track up the east coast. And if this truly sets up as a block where it's persistent for at least 10 days, we got to be watching that very carefully because there is no block in the North Pacific. It's only here in the North Atlantic that we're going to be watching most carefully. Now, let's see the result of this on the precipitation side of things first. Oh, no, first, I want to show you why it's there. Then I'll talk about precip. I think this has a lot to do with the MJO. Now, over the next 15 days, which is what you see here, all right, you see this area right into here? See how it's almost straight up and down? That's not typical of the MJO. It means it's not moving anywhere. And it's primarily, if we kind of curl this around, staying over phase five. We can explain that by looking at the trade winds. Let's just zoom in on this graphic. So here, starts today through the next 15 days. That's the end of the month. And this is the nose of those strong trade winds associated with La Nina. We've spent a lot of time talking about this. They continue to meet these westerly winds, or at least a component of the westerly wind there. And that's where the surface convergence boundary is. And it sits right here. And just like we talked about last week, when there's a La Nina and the MJO sits in phase five, this is what the atmosphere tends to do. Now you see it, the block in the North Atlantic, the negative NAO pattern with this trough here could be the other side of the omega block there, right? Downstream over Europe, cold, and the trough sits in the Gulf of Alaska, no longer up against the West Coast. And that ridge shows up here again. So systems come around, go through the Canadian Prairie, deepen over the Northeast and the Great Lakes. And that's been a remarkably consistent picture so take a look at what we get now for the week two precipitation pattern. It has trended drier in the west. The ridge is in place. We expect to see near normal precipitation midsection of the country. Active Canadian storm track, I think, continues. And these systems develop somewhere like this. They either gather or develop along the coast. And that's going to keep the east very active. It's also going to allow for more frequent intrusions of colder air there. I think we should talk about those temperatures next. Because these were the highs we saw on Monday. Look at the heat here. I mean, this is this is 25 to 30 degrees above average, and that spreads east tomorrow, Tuesday. Okay, this is Tuesday's highs compared to normal. There's Wednesday. Now you see the front passing through. It gets here by Thursday, and then as we go into the weekend, we get a quick rebound in temperatures back in the plains again as the colder air settles to the east, and this pattern is going to fluctuate until that block becomes established, and it may be there by day 10. Nah, maybe by day eight, actually, eight days from now. Because I look out there at the next time period, day five through day 10, and we can already see the colder air in place coming out of the Canadian prairie straight through to this region like we talked about before. More mild weather in the west. And the GFS is on board with this as well, all the way up to the end of the month. And that is that pattern we have been talking about for a while, potentially setting up. 
So there it is. That's it's just good to see a lot of the forecast components coming together, which we've been talking about. Now, big question is how long does it last? And what I want to say is, as long as those trade winds stay where they are, the North Pacific stays unblocked, but the North Atlantic stays blocked, this pattern isn't going anywhere. And we see that when we look at from the 25th of November to the 25th of December. See that same area of colder air right in through there. The big difference in the model runs, they backed off on the extent of the warmer conditions that were forecast here for the plains, uh, really the high plains, and also they've cooled this off a little bit in the west. On the precipitation side of things, that 30-day outlook, we do see that they, they backed off a bit on the precip in the west, now seeing that ridge more often. We're above average here. Again, this is the 25th of November through the 25th of December. We're drier from Texas, but we're gonna watch this area here and through here to be much more active. So I'll call it Great Lakes to the east coast and to the northeast. That's what I'm gonna be watching, all right? Okay, one last thing to check in on. As we talked about, this tends to, there we go, drop quite a bit of cold air in Europe. And the latest 30-day outlook from the 25th of November to the 25th of December continues to be colder for much of Central and Western Europe. That's something we've been discussing a lot lately. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up here. I appreciate you guys giving me a little bit extra time tonight to get this finished, and I hope you all have a good rest of your week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.